Again, like Paul writes to the church at Rome, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. And so again, I want us to look at a lesson from the Old Testament that gives us hope. It's from a man who cared, shared, and knew how to accept a gift. Sometimes that's difficult. But he was able to share because he cared so much for others. Of course, Jesus was that way. People would come for miles around in order to get close to Jesus because of his compassion and his love for people and his kindness. And here we are, if we're to be the church of Christ, we need to follow in his steps. We need to be that way as well. And so this verse is from the Old Testament, and this type of teaching is prevalent, emphasized in the Old Testament. The generous will themselves be blessed when they share their food with the poor. And so this morning we're going to look at God's wisdom for sharing and I want to give you three examples from the life of Elisha. It has to do with stew, bread, and then a room. That's it. It's that simple. Two items are things that he was able to share with others. The last one was a gift to him. It was hard for him to share that one. But he accepted the gift. First of all, let's notice the stew. When, when Elisha went to a place called Gilgal, and we don't know exactly where it was. You can see it on the map here. That it's up here, or is it down here? We don't know exactly where it was. But he returned there, and there was a famine in that region. And the location of Gilgal is in the Jordan Valley area somewhere, not far from Jericho. One person wrote how it might have been during this famine. The beautiful country can hardly be recognized so desolate has it now become. At one time, as far as the eye could see, nothing but golden fields of grain waved around us. Ponderous wagons met us, groaning under the rich treasures of the harvest, while the vines and the pomegranates bent beneath the weight of their luxuriant burdens. But behold, now, how significant the change. Blight has overspread the fields, the metals are parts, and a considerable part of the population are enduring the miseries of famine. Even the school of prophets, whom Elisha was visiting, shared in the hunger. When Elisha arrived at Gilgal, gloom had settled over the little community. They had little grain, strip gardens, and few resources. So here's what happens. He comes. He's got a servant with him. And while the company of the prophets was meeting with him, here he is with them. And apparently these are students. They're there. He can teach them more about the wisdom of God and the love of God. They're listening. But you know, at some point, he says it's time to eat. At some point, and I don't know what it was, maybe there was a all of this, you know, these students there, they were they're hungry, they were famished, maybe their, their stomachs were growling, and, and he could hear it. And it's difficult to teach on an empty stomach. And so he says, it was time to eat. So he says to his servant, put on the large pot and cook some stew for these men. And so he did that. And we see that Elisha was generous. Why is that? He was visiting. Now, shouldn't they be feeding him? He's a visiting teacher. But here he is coming into their midst. He's got a servant with him. And he is saying to him, make some soup. Now, Elisha probably had been given some food by others in different locations because he traveled. And people, there were certain ones who honored him by giving food. And he had that. And he was able to, to share that at that time. Well, there were other students with meager amounts that also wanted to share. 
to put into the, the pot for the stew. One of the servants may have been thankful for this opportunity to contribute to the meal, but he didn't have anything. And you can see that Elisha's generosity, it inspired generosity in others. And this guy would have participated in it also. And so he goes out, one of them, went out into the fields to gather herbs and found a wild vine. He gathered some of the gourds. That's a hard skin, like a pumpkin. But you can see them right there. He filled his, his uh, fold of his cloak. And when he returned, he cut them up into the pot of stew. And though no one knew what they were, so here they are, they have the stew, it's ready. And one of them takes a bite of it. And says, oh man of God, there is death in this pot, or in the pot. And they could not eat it. It was so bitter, it was poison, it was poisonous. They could not eat it. So Elisha said, get some flour. He put it into the pot and said, serve it to the people. To eat. And he's talking to his servant in this. Now what good would a little bit of flour do putting it into this stew that is po poisoned? The flour would take it out. Is that what would happen? I doubt it. But he told his servant to do that and he did it and, and then set it before all of these students. And can you just picture them? Sitting there, they've already taken a bite of it. It's terrible. So one might have frowned, took a bite, gulped. But as he's gulping, as he, as he has it in his mouth, he discovers it's delicious. And it, it came from God. That's the reason. It was part of the best stew he had ever tasted. And why is that? Because it came from God. In fact, God is blessing them for being generous. All of them are participating in the sharing, and then one of them brings something that, that causes the, the whole pot to be distasteful and poisonous, and he's even going to prevent their sharing from coming to fruition. Elisha said, get some flour. He put it in the pot and said, serve it to the people to eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. God did not negate even the student's wayward efforts to give. The student was inspired to give. He wanted to help. And the Lord graciously accepted his help, even though it wasn't perfect. His motivation started with Elijah and his generosity in providing the stew for them. And God used Elisha to motivate generosity in the students. So we can see Elisha was generous and Elisha's generosity inspired generosity in others. The same thing can happen today. There was a person. This was his house. His name's Leonard. 75 years old. He's sitting on the front porch. There's one guy that walks by that house every day to go to meet some other guys to, to work for the Union Pacific Railroad. And I guess one day when he's coming back, he's walking back toward his house, and he can see Leonard up there on the porch, but he sees two teenagers, and they're mocking him. They're putting him down and saying, someone ought to burn this house down. And you can just see the man. He doesn't have any any means to, to take care of that house. He's just sitting on the front porch and his, his head just kind of goes down like that in discouragement because of those mocking words. Josh goes home. He thinks about it some. And in a couple of days, he decides he's going to go back and talk to Leonard and ask him if it would be okay if he painted his house. Well, sure. Sure. And he was able to get five volunteers from the Union Pacific co-workers to help him. They had a designated Saturday they were going to have for that. But he posted it on Facebook. And on, on the social media, he put a little notice on there. And he got a lot of shares. 
And on the designated Saturday, there wasn't just the six guys that showed up. He stopped counting after there were 95 people that showed up to help out. Just the one man who saw what those teenagers were doing and the discouragement in Leonard, the person on his front porch, it inspired him to go and, and help this man in need. And what he was doing inspired others to be able to share and give and be generous as well. And so, do you think Leonard's going to be ashamed of his house now? This is actually a picture of how it looked and how it appeared after. It was all because of that one man decided to be generous and inspired others to be generous. Co-workers, at least 95 other people, strangers showing up to help out. So that's the way. to be. Gen Don't wait on the other person. Do it yourself. We also see bread in this. Now, again, a man from another location he came to Elisha. He was bringing 20 loaves of barley bread baked for the first ripe grain along with some heads of, of grain. And usually the first fruits would go to a priest, but there were a few priests in the northern tribes of Israel. And they looked upon Elijah as the representative of God as he was a priest, he was a prophet. This man wanted to bring it to him and offer his first fruits to him. And so what did, what did he do? He accepted it. He took those 20 loaves, which represented a generous, genuine sacrifice on the part of this man. And they were evidence of the man's devotion to the Lord and his respect for Elisha. So then we see that here is Elisha's compassion coming through again. And his generosity. This food was given to him, and he could have accepted it and kept it for himself, him, he and his servant, and it might have lasted a few days, but he still had these hungry guys in front of him. What was he to do? And so he said to his servant, give it to the people to eat. And can you imagine this guy looking at all these guys in these small little loaves, but they're probably not, I don't know that big. Well, so it doesn't look big, but it looks big on the screen. But he's told to share this with all of these men who are there. Elisha had an attitude of stewardship, not ownership, because he knew all things are God's, not ours. Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. The Lord's brother wrote this. He said, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. So he said, give to the people. Well, the servant was skeptical. And he made a reason, you know, I couldn't feed a hundred men with 20 tiny loaves, so why even try? And that kind of reasoning seems to make sense, but there's a weakness in it. And the weakness is that he had just fed a hundred men from one stew. A hundred men. All of these men had been fed and filled. How can I say this before a hundred men? His servant, as he asked. But Elisha answered, give it to the people to eat. For this is what the Lord says. They will eat and have some left over. Then he said for them. And they ate. And had some left over. According to the word of the Lord. And so we look at this. And we see that when God gives directions to do certain things. Even when they don't make sense. Let's do them anyway. Let's don't doubt. Like that servant did there. Good comes from trusting in God. There's a proverb that says that whoever gives heed to instruction prospers. And sometimes this word prosper means health to a person. Whoever gives heed to instruction prospers. But what does it mean to trust in God? And blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Well, 
follow what he says to do. That's trusting in the Lord. That's what that proverb says there. So on this occasion, God demonstrated his care and his generosity through the man who gave the loaves to Elisha. And then through the generosity of Elisha, God's love continued to him. And so blessings came from all that. When we practice God's word, blessings come. Blessed is the man who gains wisdom. The man who finds understanding. For she is more profitable than silver. And yours better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Those who lay hold of her will be blessed. And that's all from Proverbs chapter 3. And you look later in the chapter and it says, Do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, Come back later, I'll give it tomorrow, when you now have it with you. We are to be generous and to be helpful to others. And so there's the importance of sharing. We see it throughout Scripture. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Paul also says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And what do we see Christ doing? We find that whenever we take opportunities, when we see opportunities to share, wonderful things happen. Opportunity to express our love for others in small, practical ways, and they're blessed and we're blessed as well. Jesus specialized in small, menial ways to help people, like washing dirty feet. He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. And then after washing all their feet, he said, a new commandment that I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And that's what Jesus demonstrated. By washing dirty feet. We also see that he cooked breakfast for his disciples. On the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he was cooking breakfast. They didn't realize it. They were out there fishing. But there he was on the shore, and it was before he ascended into heaven, or it was a little bit after that. But he was preparing breakfast for them. We also find that there were parents bringing their little children to be blessed by Jesus. And of course the disciples thought, Jesus doesn't have time for this. What, what, what were they saying? They were saying that these little ones are not important enough for Jesus to spend time with them. But Jesus said, and he took the children, he said, let them come to me. And he said, and he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. They were valuable to him. He loved them. He blessed them. And he took the time for those little children. And he even helped those that no one else would help, like lepers. There was one leper that came up to him and on occasion said, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus put his hand on his shoulder and said, be willing. I am willing. Be clean. And he was clean. So this proverb says that whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. And he will reward them for what they have done. How can the poor give back? They're in need. They can't. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. Think of them. They're the Lord's creation. These are people that God values that he sent his one and only son to die for, that he wants everyone in his family. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and what will he do? And he will reward them for what they have done. And we've all experienced that. There's that other proverb that says, whoever refreshes others 
and be refreshed. And so, here we have the generous will themselves be blessed when they share their food with the poor. Uh, what just happened? It just blew up my my projector, I think. I don't know. Wait. I'm continuing. Look at me. <laughs> Jesus said this. See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spend. Yet I tell you not that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you or you of little faith? So do not worry about saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly Father knows you need them. And then he says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Well, how did that happen? Is it some mysterious way that this happens? Well, here's how it happened in the early church. There were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. And so when we, when we look at this, we find that that promise of Jesus is fulfilled by people who can see the love of Jesus, the love of God. They are motivated to be generous and helpful to others. And that's what happened in the first, in the first century. They were that way. And the Apostle John puts it this way. He says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ led on his life for us and we ought to lay on our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words and tongue, but with actions and in truth. I was going to show you uh, an example of this woman who was in her wheelchair. It was a power wheelchair. And she was just outside with it, and it began to rain. And for some reason, that power machine did not work. Now. <laughs> what happened? When did that start? Five minutes ago. Five minutes ago? <laughs> oh, wow. Anyway, it works. And that worked too because four guys came up to her and started pushing. And they were using an umbrella to try to cover her. And they got her out from the rain. They were helping her in that way. They were being generous. They were being kind. They were being helpful. Now, think about Elisha. Did he miss any meals? Did he go hungry because he was generous and helpful to others? There's no evidence of that. He helped. The way to share much is to share a little each day. That's a good way to do it. It kind of adds up. One person wrote, I shovel out blessings to others. And God shovels the blessings in, and he's got a bigger shovel than I do. So Jesus says, give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And so we see in all of this, here is a man who knew how to share he had compassion, he had generosity, and blessings came in people's ways because of that. God blessed them. There's one other thing, and it's that room. Here you have Elisha, who was a man who cared and shared, and he traveled. And he would go from one location to another. One of the places that he would go 
is in this valley, the Jezreel Valley. And he had this opportunity to accept a gift there that he couldn't give to anyone else. He also knew how to honor others by accepting their gifts. Elijah was a person who would receive and who also knew the importance of taking the gift from the giver. And so we have him in this area. He would travel in this area quite often. And it's close to Mount Carmel. You can see right here. But he's in this Jezreel Valley. There was a, a couple that lived there. They were a very hospitable couple. And when Elisha would come through with his servant, they would make provisions for them. They would feed them and try to find a place for them to, to stay at their, their place. But the woman asked her husband, why don't we just build a room in addition to the house for Elisha? And they furnished it. And they did that. And then the next time that Elisha comes through, he is said, this is your room. What's he going to do? What is he going to do? He didn't say, I'm not worthy of this. Or he didn't say, you shouldn't have gone to so much trouble for me with a furnished room. There, he just accepted it. He accepted the gift. He didn't give any of the excuses, but instead he graciously accepted the gift. And when people compliment us or give gifts, the best thing to do is to say, and you've learned this, you know it, thank you. Thank you. And just accept it. That's what, that's what Elisha did. There's more to the story. But I just wanted to point that out, that he knew how to give, he knew how to receive. And he blessed people either way, by receiving or giving. And that's what we can do as well. Elisha was a man who cared, and a man who shared. And he knew how to honor others with the gifts that they gave him. And so this was the story of the man who cared, shared, and graciously accepted gifts. And the proverb says, he who walks with the wise grows wise. We just grew a little wiser today because we walked with Elisha. And let's remember, let's remember what James wrote, the Lord's brother. He said that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Good and perfect gifts. What are they meant for? 